This is the second of three videos on democracy in a globalized world. <clears throat> this video will go over the ideas about the impact of globalization on modern democracy. Held explains that the globalization and increasing interconnection, interconnectedness of nations and societies contradict some of the fundamental assumptions on which almost all democratic theory has been based. These are assumptions about the the, the nature of a constituency, the meaning of representation, the proper form and scope of political participation, and the relevance of the democratic nation state as a guarantor of the rights, duties, and well, welfare of subjects or citizens. And that, in turn, raises important questions about the coherence, the viability and the accountability of national decision-making entities or governments. So this is about the question of can or should nation-based institutions make decisions that impact the international community? What happens to its citizens' democratic rights to make decisions about the things that affect their well-being in a globalized world? So these are questions about who votes, who is represented, who are the constituents, who decides, who leads, and who gets to who makes these um, decisions that affect you on an individual basis. Now, starting on page 294, Held examines the traditional concept of the sovereign, autonomous nation state. You'll notice in footnote two on page 295, how differentiates between autonomy as applied to the state versus how autonomy is used regarding the autonomous citizen in chapter 10. State autonomy is not the same as the principle of autonomy. State autonomy is the ability of the state to fulfill policy objectives. The principle of autonomy is about how much those policies are shaped by citizen deliberation and involvement. Sovereignty is the link between those two notions of autonomy. So a sovereign nation is able to fulfill policy objectives and legitimately and authoritatively represents its citizens. The central question is this, has sovereignty remained intact while the autonomy of the state has been altered? Or has the modern state actually faced a loss of sovereignty? In other words, is there a disjuncture or a disconnection between the formal domain of authority, which all states, all nation states claim, and the realities or the, of the structures, the practices of the political and economic systems operating at regional and global levels, the globalization? Hell's answer is yes. There are at least four major areas of disjuncture or disconnection that illustrate shifting patterns of powers and constraints of the sovereign nation state that have resulted from these new intersections of national, international, and transnational forces and relationships. Held says that these are disconnections or disjunctures between the contemporary or current global system, which has been globalized, and the theory of the nation state. These disjunctures, Held describes, tend to really actually illustrate the ways in which globalization operates. So the first disjuncture is related to the idea of economic globalization, which we talked about in the previous video. This is the idea that within the world economy, there is a disconnection between the formal authority of the state to make economic decisions or control the economy and the actual system of production, distribution, and exchange that is controlled by these fast-growing multinational corporations, or MNCs for short. Here, there has been a, the globalization of both production and financial transactions that have been organized and controlled by these MNCs or multinational corporations. Even when an MNC has a clear national base of operation, so maybe it's located in Canada, there's still a focus on global profitability rather than just within the nation. B, there's been unprecedented increases in trade at all levels within and across regions, including staggering increases in global financial flows. In 2005, so 
15 years ago, multinational corporations controlled more than a quarter of world production, 80% of world industrial output, and a third of world trade. Because of their size, these MNCs impact state macroeconomic policies because they can, they can easily respond to changes in things like interest rates, shift, they can shift production from one country to another to save money or to you know, have cheaper labor and so on. Um, because they're able to do that, it makes it much harder for nations to control the state of their own economy because they don't control, the state does not control multinational corporations. Technology also plays a role here. Te technological advances in communication and transportation are essentially erasing the borders of, of, between what have been separate markets. These borders or boundaries have been what allowed for independent national economic policy. Now, markets and societies are so sensitive to each other, you know, a stock market crash in one region or country can have a ripple effect around the world. The integration of markets, such as the one between Canada, U.S., and Mexico, formerly called NAFTA, can make it difficult for an individual country to support one industry without violating the rules of the trade agreement. So in Canada, this has been seen regarding support for farmers and for the development of sustainable energy policies. We're also seeing it today when we look at how um, flows of um, goods and products uh, across the border can happen when we're shutting down travel between countries. Finally, D, these shifts are have been uneven around the world. Some regions have been better able to isolate themselves from these transnational networks. Um, this is probably less true today than what when Held was writing, since China, for example, has increasingly opened its doors to international trade. Nonetheless, some countries are clearly better able to maintain control over their economic policies so the economic impact of, this, of globalization has been uneven. Now, the second disjuncture occurs where international political decision making happens. That is at the intersection of the international rules and organizations that we use to manage transnational activity. These are the things that we use all the time, but, are not but we're not usually aware of them until something goes wrong. So this is regarding things like trade, rules around trade, rules around transportation across borders, the use of oceans, air travel, and so on. To deal with our interactions across national borders and to create collective policies, uh, we have created tens of thousands of international government, governmental organizations, or IGOs, as well as international non-governmental organizations, or INGOs. IGOs, international governmental organizations, are composed of representatives of government and are an important part of international law. IGOs include things like the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the Universal Postal Union, so that we can mail stuff around the world, and so on. Those are just a few examples. Non-governmental organizations are independent from national government and are often advocacy groups, such as Amnesty International or Oxfam. Now, creating these international governmental organizations can have a significant impact on the perception of not national sovereignty. Take the European Union, for instance. The EU has enormous potential to improve the way in which people live, work, and travel in Europe so that you don't have to go through border crossings or customs when you're traveling or working, for example. However, the perception that individual countries have lost control of their own decision making has led to the exit of Great Britain from the European Union, or Brexit. Um, and this is going to have considerable ripple effects. So all of these shifts tend to lead to new ways of thinking about how to govern at an international level with regards to things like defense, national security, migration, all sorts of things. Now, the third disjuncture occurs at the point where international law creates new systems of legal regulations that will impact individuals, governments, and non-governmental organizations. The development of law at an international level means that the claims or sovereignty of a nation state can be superseded by another nation state. 
In other words, when a nation signs on to an international law, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or UNDRIP, which is the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a state agrees to forego certain rights of their nation to make rules in order to follow the international law. However, there are few, if any, methods of coercive power to back up this international law. So there's not really any way to make sure that even if a, a, a country agrees to follow these rules, that they will actually do so. For example, there's two legal rules that uphold national sovereignty. There's immunity from jurisdiction and immunity of state agencies. These two rules protect a government's autonomy in foreign matters and prevents domestic courts from ruling on the behavior of foreign states. In recent years, there have been increasing tensions between national sovereignty and international law, particularly with regards to um, efforts to protect human rights. However, the complexities in navigating the balance between national sovereignty and international law are challenging to say the least. But an alternative world order based on a transnational or cosmopolitan community has long been a goal for many. The fourth structure that Health describes is about the idea that a nation is an autonomous center of culture that allows the opportunity to create and sustain a national identity in a secure environment for its people in the face of all of these interlinked changes in uh, media and environment and the environment that has happened through globalization. So one example is the spread of English as the dominant language of, quote, elite cultures. And this is elite in terms of business, computing, law, science and politics, that kind of thing. So English has become the dominant language for communicating in these areas of business, academia, academia, computer, um, information technology, law, science, and so on. Um, these things have uh, occurred alongside the international and globalization of telecommunications. There's also been a huge increase in things like tourism, as well as the entertainment industry. Remember too, that health was writing in an era before Netflix began streaming videos in 2010. All of these things have made it increasingly difficult for nations to sustain a national culture. Think here is the fact that Canada has long had Canadian content requirements for television and radio, but how do you enforce that today when we have streaming from around the world? Environmental problems are another example that demonstrate the difficulty faced by nations and state-based policies to deal with environmental changes that are global in scope. Now, health summarizes um, this relationship between democracy and the global system and concludes that there has been, one, a further internationalization of domestic activities, two, an intensification of decision-making in international frameworks, and three, an alteration of the powers of the modern sovereign state by international and transnational relations. Health believes that these disjunctures tend to limit state autonomy and increasingly infringe on state sovereignty. So they're, they're kind of undermining the traditional way we've seen the state. They are also fundamentally challenging the idea of the democratic nation state as a community of fate or community of chance within fixed boundaries or borders, and in which a legitimate government pursues policies which have the consent of those they affect and is able to determine its own fate. Held's analysis then demonstrates a number of ways in which the very process of governance seems to be escaping the category of the nation state. As a result, Held says, quote, the model of democratic autonomy has to be rethought in relation to a series of overlapping local, regional, and global structures and processes. Doing so leads out to this idea of the cosmopolitan model of democracy that, that we're going to talk about in the next video.